Hey guys, this video is brought to you by .tech Domains. It seems like as programmers, we're always working on some sort of side project, whether it's like a startup, software as a service, or a portfolio site. Picking and finding a domain is actually really, really difficult to do because there's several rules that you should always look at. I mean, the domain should be relevant, it should be short, it should be less than two words, ideally. Also, having the .tech in your domain signifies that you're in technology. So go ahead and join others such as Austin Evans, Consumer Electronics Show, and Viacom when it comes to securing your .tech domain. The link in the description tab below includes a 90% discount. Hey, what's up? All right, so this video, we're going to be looking at the top 10 fastest growing languages right now. I'm looking at what is considered to be programming languages, so not libraries or anything like that. And, um, and really where the information comes, it just comes from all over the internet, really. It comes from 10 years of doing this and just, you know, what I hear about a lot and what I see personally. So, all right, guys, so number 10 on this list is going to go to C++. And this is a really old language, but to be honest with you, it's one that really just cannot be replaced as much as that, like, we've tried, we've heard from so many other languages that we're going to replace C++ and uh, C++ just continues to hang around, and the reason why is because it's literally one of the fastest languages out there. It gives you uh, full control over memory management. It's not a garbage collected language, um, so that means it's a lot more difficult to work with, but for the most part, like if you're going to be doing cutting edge video graphics and things like that, the engine you're using was probably built in C++. Even things like Node.js are written in C++. A lot of people think Node.js is JavaScript, but it's really not. It's a runtime that was created in C++, and you use JavaScript as a scripting language to use it. C++ is also responsible for a lot of like powerful software, like I mentioned, like Photoshop. I mean, if you're going to create something like Photoshop, you're going to probably need to use C++. All right, guys, number nine on the list is going to go to C Sharp, and this is because .NET Core and all the improvements that Microsoft has made over the years. But in addition to the language itself just growing and Microsoft's you know, .NET library just seeming to grow, it's now involved in things like Unity. So Unity is capable of building AAA-level games now, I've seen some incredible VR games and things that are now being created in Unity. It just keeps getting better and better, and that's just one small aspect of what you can use C-sharp and especially .NET Core for. Um, so going forward, you know, .NET Core is going to be the standard, and a lot of people still associate Windows uh, or C-sharp with, with Windows, but it's really not anymore. All right, number eight is going to go to Kotlin, and Kotlin seems to be gaining more and more popularity because it's an easier way of creating your Android app, uh, applications. So Android, the runtime, actually runs using Java and the Java Virtual Machine. Uh, Kotlin is a language built on top of the Java Virtual Machine, so you use it to build your Android applications. Some of the companies that are using it are Evernote. They use the, the, it to create their Android application. Uh, also, Pinterest is a company that used um, it as well for their Android app. All right, guys, the next one up is going to go to Google's Dart language. Uh, it's called Dart Lang. And this one's been a confusing thing because for the longest time we thought it was going to compete with JavaScript and then it started being like more of a mobile app development thing, although you can build websites with it too. Uh, the thing is, it is exploding in popularity. It's one of the easiest ways of creating your web application. In fact, I have a video on and like literally 30 minutes I show you in this video how to set it up on an Android phone and I'm actually viewing this on my own Android phone uh, by the end of it and creating this uh, little new music app or whatever. So it's very easy to get started with. It's really the, the main reason, but Dart goes hand in hand with the Flutter framework, which is what I just showed you to build your Android or iOS apps. And it's very similar to React Native and also there's other projects like this, like better Flutter UI templates that I just saw. I mean, these are absolutely fantastic looking templates that you can use for free in your Flutter Dart uh, application. All right, guys, so number six is going to go to the Golang or Go programming language, the language that was created also from Google. And this was really created by Google because it wanted to be a successor to both C++ and Python. It needed the speed of C++ and it needed the ease of development um, and learning that Python provides. So it really, it's a combination of those two. It's very fast, built with concurrency in mind. Um, the other day I did a video on a Go, uh, Go Fiber 
web framework, and that's uh, this new framework from the Golang language. And I have like a quick start application on here, but according to the benchmarks, it's like much, much faster than Node.js. And if the speeds do really hold up, then like you really cannot ignore something like that for a static website. There's no reason not to use it uh, over something like Node and Express. Obviously, depending on the application and the amount of work involved to, to get it uh, deployed. This is just one small example of what Go could be used for, which is a web framework, but it's also in things like um, you know, big data, machine learning, uh, audio, video editing, really anywhere that you can tap into concurrency. All right, guys, so the next up is going to be Rust, and uh, Rust is growing in popularity every day because it, this, if there is a successor to C++, a lot of people are saying that it's going to be a language like Rust, and uh, Rust is very performant. It's immutable by default. Um, it was created by the people over at Mozilla that are responsible for like the Firefox browser. They're big into WebAssembly at the moment. So WebAssembly can actually be a, a target for your Rust code. You could write Rust code and target it out to West, uh, WebAssembly. Uh, and therefore you could use very performant Rust code to do all kinds of things like even create games. As an example, this game, is actually created using WebAssembly. So I'm controlling the character and everything. It's running inside of a browser. Uh, but this was created in Unity, so really it's C++ that's porting out to, um, to Wasm WebAssembly, but you could also do the same thing with Rust. All right, guys, so number four is going to be SQL, and this is probably the most boring one on the list because it's been around since the 1970s. It's the oldest one on the list as well, but it is a programming language um, no matter how you look at it, it's called structured query language. What is SQL used for? It's used for literally, it's used by literally everyone, but it's also, it's, it's really for storing your database, uh, your data, right? So it's a, it's a database system and it's in a very efficient way of being able to read, uh, and make sense of a very complex data, uh, using relational table tables and such. Uh, but the, the bottom line is that there's all kinds of different flavors of SQL, so it's like difficult to say, oh, just learn SQL. You could go to and like learn the basics, like select all from customers. That's kind of your starting point. But from there, it gets a lot more complex. There's a lot of options in SQL. Being a database administrator uh, is something that like the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States is, is projecting that it's going to increase uh, nearly as much as just you know as, as every other STEM field like software engineering. Uh, but the, the need for database administrators is not going to go away. We look at all this big data stuff. Um, having to store uh, that data, it, it all has to be done somewhere. Uh, pretty much every CRUD application, obviously, behind the scenes is going to be connecting to some database somewhere. And uh, really 90% of the time, it's going to be SQL. All right, guys, so number three is going to go to TypeScript. And why? It's because pretty much every large JavaScript project out there Ever since TypeScript started taking off, probably three to four years ago, that it really started taking off, um, it seems like every new project, three three times out of five, like people are choosing the TypeScript route versus Babel, and using um, you know pro, a, a prop libraries to help you type check uh, using Babel. I forget what the hell that's called even because I use TypeScript myself. But anyway, TypeScript it saves you from running a uh, writing a bunch of uh, runtime errors uh, for type collisions that you're you're definitely um, going to run into anytime you're building a complex JavaScript application just because of the nature uh, of the way the JavaScript was designed and written it, it being a dynamically interpreted duck typed language it's easy to make type errors so that's why TypeScript is called TypeScript it's to protect you from all that stuff all right, guys, so number two is going to go to Python, and Python has been a very popular language for a long time now. It was created in 1990, somewhere around like the mid-2010s or so, it became the number one most taught language in universities. Around, that, uh, around the time of like 2008, the MVC web architecture kind of kick-started, and Django, the web framework from Python, came out. Websites like Instagram, Pinterest used it. Reddit's built on Python. So Python's in the web, um, and it's also in some very basic like video gaming stuff, a lot of systems administration work. And then the biggest thing that Python is in right now is machine learning. So things like TensorFlow, uh, Keras, all this stuff. Like 
um, NumPy, SciPy, Anaconda, all these different like data crunching libraries and things that, that Python is great at. It excels at, at data science. Um, when we talk about like OpenAI, GPT-3, like what is the best language for natural language processing and all that, stu that stuff, uh, it's going to be Python. Python's the easiest to script with all that. And even if, you know, under the core, like TensorFlow, um, you write Python to interact with it, but TensorFlow itself was written in C++ uh, for the speed that it needed. Uh, but anyway, Python's not built with all this speed in mind, but you can write Python scripts that interact with uh, other th other scripts and DLLs and such that are compiled using faster languages. And that's what we see a lot in the Python ecosystem and specifically with data science. All right, and number one on the list is going to go to JavaScript. I know that's probably boring or predictable or whatever, but the thing is is that all of our business, no matter how much you want to hype up natural language processing and how it's going to take our jobs or like, you know, how the next game framework is going to do this or that or whatever, like all business is run on the web for the most part these days. Even companies that aren't connected to the web, they are computers that have browsers that are like browser-based applications on local area networks. And JavaScript is the only language that runs in the browser. So uh, you could argue WebAssembly or whatever is going to be the, the new standard. Um, and that's really, you know, until that takes off, until we're actually writing uh, Rust applications that are literally mimicking the, the, the JavaScript DOM the way JavaScript can, then um, we're going to continue to see JavaScript dominate. It's going to have the most jobs. Everything that's built off of it has so much in, like endless potential. Um, you know, things like React, Redux, Angular, Vue, all that stuff. Um, those are just some of the small examples. Um, it goes on and on with JavaScript. And, and until there's some sort of replacement, which WebAssembly is not there, JavaScript has the most potential. And it's going to continue to be the fastest growing. All right, so if you're learning web development and you want to learn from me, check out my website, CodeHawk.com. I have courses on pretty much the latest in web development. I'm not doing anything beyond that just because I am a web developer. I, I've decided I'm not going to try to teach things that I don't do day to day. But anyway, guys, uh, thanks for watching and have a good day. Bye.